Welcome to the Shockcast. I'm John Little, broadcasting on a slightly chilly Tainan evening on Sunday, February 24th, 2019. Please remember the, that last week's YouTube playlist is available in the playlist section of the Omega Shock YouTube channel or in the description section below. And please read my book, Ezekiel's Fire. It's free on EzekielsFire.com and it won't always be. Today, we're going to be talking about the Dunning-Kruger effect and giving an example. In the rest of this video, we have the coming of Gog and Magog and even more Gog and Magog. Martin Armstrong has a dire prediction about 2032 and says that the problems begin in 2020, next year. There's something called the Smiling Depression, mine and maybe yours. There's treason and corruption in the U.S. Congress and in the U.S. government in general, the Antichrist has a problem that he needs to overcome if he is to rule effectively. There are those who rape children using YouTube to promote their evil and foul, evil, disgusting, horrible, don't get me started. And then the foul and evil Roman Catholic Church of Satan is also out there still raping children. There is more proof of Ezekiel's fire and more evidence of peak oil. And no, none of that is good. Christians are being persecuted in China, and it's bad. The prophecy contained in Isaiah 19 has taken a big, big step forward. The economy is not doing well, not nearly as well as advertised. Gold and silver are starting to look good, and Libya is getting ready to be a member of Gog and Magog, the alliance of Gog and Magog. Oh, and the Palestinians? They're threatening to act like idiots again. That's a lot, so let's jump into today's program. The Dunning-Kruger effect is killing us. Our world rushes into the abyss with such stunning speed that there seems to be little that we can do except stand open-mouthed in shock. To even attempt to warn the thundering herd of their insanity is to risk bodily harm and even death. If you stand in the way, you will certainly be trampled. And it seems to have everything to do with an observation by David Dunning and Justin Kruger. The truly incompetent think that they are capable. The truly capable worry that they are incompetent. You see this everywhere and it is utterly amazing, a defect in our nature. I think that I can speak for all of you when I say that we've been fighting insanity for all of our lives. The battle usually starts with our own insanity. Parents, church, and education were supposed to help us along the way towards sanity. But the best that we've been able to do is get close. If you have actually attained that painful condition that we like to think of as sane, you have my sympathy. It means that you get to keep your head while watching everyone lose theirs, and it's utterly depressing. As I look around me, it seems that very few have enough brain cells working to actually understand what is happening. In fact, meeting someone with any understanding is so rare that I suffer a bit of shock. The desire to put that person under a microscope and discover how they achieved this moment of clarity is almost overwhelming. In fact, I've had to get a firm grip on myself more than once when talking to someone who actually gets it. It's a good thing that I don't have a heart condition, or I might have died from shock years ago. It is far more common for Mrs. Little to ask me to calm down and stop attempting to strangle a person for being completely insane. More than one person probably owes their continued existence to the intervention of my lovely wife. And every time I feel the urge to throttle someone, I often find myself mystified by their horrifying stupidity. And it gives me a little comfort, but just a little, to know that there's a name for their affliction. The Dunning-Kruger effect. Here are a couple of interesting videos on the subject. The first one is the Dunning-Kruger effect and why you're dumber than you think. And then why incompetent people think they're amazing from david dunning oh and there's this far more 
concise and famous explanation from John Cleese. It's titled, John Cleese on Stupidity, the Dunning-Kruger Effect. Unfortunately for Mr. Cleese, his last comment was proof of what we're talking about. So, how do you know that you suffer from this affliction? I guarantee that you do. I certainly do. I am completely confident that I suffer this condition alongside you. I just don't always know where I suffer it the most. To put it more succinctly, I'm smart enough to know that I'm stupid. Like, I like what Ralph Barbagallo said on the subject in, this, in his short article titled, How to Know If You Are Suffering from Dunning-Kruger. The first two paragraphs are these, quote, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a plague that strangles the progress of humanity. It is the fact that those who suck overestimate their ability, while those who don't underestimate their ability. Dunning-Kruger is what keeps money flowing to the confident and inept, only for these funds to be set ablaze in a bonfire of incompetence. Once the fire is out, a new flame burns as the cycle repeats. Those who possess true skill often do not have the self-confidence to start their own fire. Perhaps this is why we don't have our flying car. Close quote. In that article, Ralph is speaking from a business point of view, but you can apply it everywhere. But Mr. Barbagallo added something else to this idea, an added dimension. It's in this statement. Dunning-Kruger is what keeps money flowing to the confident and inept. Yes, that's the one. It's that exceptional aura of confidence and capability that so many foolish and moronic business people exude. And that shining confidence draws the unwary like moths to a flame. The same goes for politicians. They are the ultimate examples. Think of all the morons who have stood in front of a microphone and confidently proclaimed their ability to fix all the world's problems if you just elect them on election day. And inspired by their self-confidence and grandiose dreams, we elected them only to be disappointed in their extreme stupidity and corruption. And then we do it again and again. What we need to do is elect people who are smart and don't know if they can fix our problems, but will give an honest effort to do their best. But we aren't inspired by such timidity. We like confident, masculine people that inspire us with their vision of a fantastic future. If you need an example, think of that Green New Deal that Occasional Cortex presented to us recently. Then there's Al Gore and his global warming. Obama promised that if we liked our doctor, we could keep our doctor. Theresa May claimed that she could make a good deal with the European Union over Brexit. Merkel promised that more immigrants would solve the pension crisis. Oh, and flat earthers still say that the earth is flat. Thankfully, we don't elect them to Congress. Or no, wait, maybe we do. Anyway, when I first stumbled across the flat earth insanity, I didn't know about the Dunning-Kruger effect, so I just called it the flat earth mentality. My most recent article on the subject comes from last year, the flat earth mentality. And even though I do talk about those who are flat earthers, that's not the main subject. I'm talking about the kind of thinking that brings us to believing in such crazy ideas like the flat earth. Now, why do we keep creating such insane ideas? It's part of what Ralph said about the money flowing to the, to the confident and inept. We are drawn to those who speak with confidence, even if these people don't know what they are talking about. And they are confident because these foolish leaders do not know that they are inept. Please understand that these morons are convincing precisely because they believe in what they are saying. They believe that they are correct. Occasional Cortex really does believe in her Green New Deal. Bernie Sanders really does believe that socialism works. Flat earthers really do believe that the earth is flat. 
All of those people are honest in their convictions and we hear their honesty. And if we are foolish enough, we'll respond positively to that honesty and conviction and give them our votes and or our money. We will believe them. Worse, the internet has given far too many people a platform to speak from where they can sway the ignorant and foolish. And it's killing us. The challenge is in escaping this affliction, in avoiding the pitfall of assuming that we are more competent than we really are. And part of the secret lies in the first of the last three sentences in that article by Ralph Barbagallo. Quote, I like to say that I'm just smart enough to know that I'm a complete idiot. But when it comes to Dunning-Kruger, it's not enough to be humble. You could be faking it. Oops, he talked about that horrible word, humility. And yes, we absolutely need it if we are to survive the coming months and years. But unfortunately, some people are good at faking humility, even to themselves. Of course, Ralph is talking about business. And I'm more interested in your ability to navigate the uncertain future of these last days. And that requires more than just knowledge that you are a complete idiot. In spiritual things, you must confine yourself to what the Bible actually says, and not what you think it says, or even what someone told you that it says. Please understand that Jesus called us sheep. And it wasn't out of admiration for our intelligence. God knows that we're stupid. But he did say this, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. John 10, 27. As the world falls apart around us, as countless numbers of foolish people chase after insanity, we must devote ourselves to hearing his voice and following him. He is our safety in the midst of madness. Now we get to the news and analysis from this past week. However, before going on, take a moment to click the subscribe button below and hit that bell to be notified when the next Shockcast happens. Those of you listening via MP3, make sure that you are subscribed to The Shock Letter at theshockletter.com. The Shockcast is just a fraction of what is in The Shock Letter that goes out every Friday for absolutely free. And unsubscribing is easy and I will never share your email ever. Again, read my book, Ezekiel's Fire. It's free, for now, because it might save your life, and you can find it at EzekielsFire.com. Please read that book. I want you to survive what is coming. Now, let's get back to the news and analysis. We start with a perfect example of evil and stupid government, or the Dunning-Kruger effect in action. The link is titled, Grand Canyon Tourist Exposed to Radiation, Safety Manager Says. This is an example of why governments are always corrupt. And yes, the word is always. And the only way to keep that corruption down is to have watchdog groups constantly monitoring and checking to make sure that they aren't acting in a corrupt manner. Five gallon paint buckets were full of high grade uranium ore and there were near exhibits that a thousand people a year would stand around for minutes or even half, uh, tens of minutes at a time. And they tried to cover it up. Worse, this is just a museum. Who knows what other horrifying stuff is out there being covered up? Are we supposed to be wearing Geiger counters wherever we go? Again, the reason why we cannot have large government is because we are all, all of us, you and me included, corrupt morons. That's right, evil and stupid. And yes, even those who call themselves Christians. I've been cheated by Christians multiple times, so don't claim that they're any better. At least the ones that I got cheated by in America. Thankfully, God is going to come and knock everything down and give the survivors a thousand years of goodness during the millennium. At least we'll have that. I just can't believe how stupid we are. It's just amazing. As a side note, after reading all this and writing that comment, I had to stop my research and writing. I was ready to chew, na chew nails and maybe even crawl at Mrs. Little, which is a very dangerous thing to do. So for the sake of self-preservation, I had to stop and do something else. What an amazing... Oh, I was, I was in... That was bad.
But next, we talk about Martin Armstrong's prediction of Great Destruction by 2032, a process that begins next year in 2020. I believe that his prediction points to the coming of Gog and Magog and Ezekiel's fire, but it also might point to the rise of the Antichrist too, although it's hard to tell since Ezekiel's fire will make a thorough mess of things. How we recover from all that is hard to see. Oh, and the reason why I play such importance on this is that the person presenting this dire prediction is Martin Armstrong, someone that I have tremendous respect for. His accuracy is unparalleled, so I pay attention to what he says. And there are three links that he put on his website that we should talk about. The first one is explaining the fall of Western society as we know it. Remember what I said about Martin Armstrong's prediction of a final collapse of Western civilization by 2032. I talked about it last week. Well, it's his computer model that is predicting it, and that model has been right on the money for far too long. Yet Martin hopes that we can avoid this. Unfortunately, it seems that Western civilization needs to fall so that the Antichrist can rise. And a part of that fall will be the war that precedes it. What war? Well, Gog and Magog. Martin doesn't refer to that, but that's what the Bible talks about. And that massive solar flare or micronova that takes everything down will knock all, all knock us all back and maybe even a few, even for a brief period of time, maybe back into the 19th century, who knows? And we will only have ourselves to blame when it happens. Then in the next link, it's titled, Where Does 2032 Come From? And it's a bit more on that 2032 idea. It seems that others are picking up on what Martin is saying without citing his work, which I find to be interesting. Remember that they threw him, Martin Armstrong, into solitary confi confinement in New York to try and steal his computer model from him. He refused, and they threw him in jail. Into unending solitary confinement to try and destroy him. And I'm glad that the psychopaths didn't succeed. And just so you know, the CIA played a big part in that attempt. The next one is titled, The Divorce Agreement to Avoid Revolution. As an extension of this discussion of the year 2032, Martin shared a bit of a viral text that has been going around called The Divorce Agreement. It's humorous, but that's not the important part. The part that you need to pay attention to is the first paragraph before it gets into that viral bit of text. Quote, here is something that is going viral. It is the reality of our political economic situation as we head into 2032 and begin to watch this cascade out of control when 2020 comes. If we do not respect what is written here, there will be no choice for society and it will lead to revolution and blood in the streets. Historically, this always occurs because those on the left seek to oppress those who want to be left alone. When such threats emerged in Europe, those who wanted to be left alone fled to North America. Close quote. Remember what he's saying here. The cascade out of control begins in 2020. That's next year. Will you be ready for that? I'm not sure I am. Now, let's talk about depression. Or smiling depression. I don't really talk like talking about depression, but too many of you have it, so I need to bring it up. Worse, those of you who don't have it need to know about how to help. And some of you are doing real damage without realizing it. I know that you mean well, but the harm is real. And our topic comes from a link titled Smiling Depression. It's possible to be depressed while appearing happy. Here's why that's particularly dangerous. Longtime readers of Omega Shock know that I suffer from chronic, unending depression. And it's really bad. I've also suffered this condition for pretty close to all of my life. But it crept up on me gradually enough that by the time I figured out that I needed help, it was already too late to stop it, assuming that stopping it was possible. It's also prevalent on both sides of my family, and my autoimmune conditions might be the main cause for my depression. 
For those of you interested in the details, I have Hashimoto's disease and Henoch Schonlein purpura, and who knows what else. And yes, there could be a third one running around in there. Yet I have had a tremendous amount of success. For all of my depression, I've been doing really well. I've always been able to do whatever it is that I wanted to do. I've spent 23 years in Asia. I'm married to the most beautiful woman on the planet, and I'm good at what I do when I'm doing it. Although I could be suffering a little Dunning-Kruger when I say that. The thing is, the world is my oyster, which is a very strange saying that I've never quite understood, but I know what it means. I'm also an incurable optimist, which must be unusual to hear because I do so much gloom and doom writing, but it's true. I truly believe that we, you and I, can do anything we set our minds to if God wills it. If we merely submit ourselves to God, nothing can stop us. And I am living walking proof of this. And if you hear any clicks in the background, who knows what that is. It could be the demons next door. I even have a sense of humor and love to laugh, yet my depression is crushing. So much so that there are times when I can barely move, where it takes everything that I have just to read and write, and sometimes not even then. It's as if I'm weighted down with a thousand pounds of lead. Here, let me moan and groan a bit over my afflictions. Here's what I generally feel. Worthlessness, hopelessness, futurelessness, is, if that's a word. Failure, helplessness, weakness, fatigue, emptiness, aches and pains, lots of those, and a rather strong desire to be hit by a bus at times. If anyone needs someone for a mission with zero chance of survival for a good enough cause, count me in. I've got all that turned up to 11, which makes no sense. My personality is literally the opposite of all of that although the aches and pains have gotten worse over the past few years, which is either my autoimmune diseases or just getting older. Probably both. I'm really mystified by all of this, but it's there, so I accept it and have gotten treatment for it, which has helped a little. And the only reason why I talk about it is because there are so very many of you who suffer with me in this. And if I could take your depression away, I would in a heartbeat. I really know what you are going through, and I hate the thought that you have to suffer like this. Those of you who do not suffer depression, you don't understand and cannot understand, and we don't want you to understand because you'd have to be there with us. Yes, there might have been moments in your life when you were depressed. But chronic depression is a far, far nastier animal. It never, ever ends. Any let up in this affliction, any breather is only temporary. It'll be back again all too soon with a vengeance. And you know that it will only end when you die. So you look forward to death. It's the ultimate anesthetic. When you die, the pain will end. It will be over. The best that I have been able to do to try and help others understand is to ask them to imagine, and I'm asking you, that having flu symptoms every day, all day, for the rest of your life, never ever ending, always having them, except for brief moments in time when there's a small pause in your affliction. Most still don't get it, but some do. And in a very real sense, chronic depression is like the flu an unending case of the flu. Now, for those of you who sympathize with me in my affliction, I appreciate it, but it's not my purpose for writing or talking about it, and I am richly blessed anyway. Thank you. Oh, and I'm stubborn and strong-willed, which helps, and I have a wife who has a sense of humor about all this. She really knows how to give you a smile when you need one. So, I'm really good. What I really want is for you to be sympathetic and even empathetic. To those around you, for many sufferers, their strength isn't enough. For many who suffer, they don't have the help of friends and family. Worse, those who suffer depression are regularly abused by those who sneer at their affliction. They mock those who take antidepressants. And yes, I'm looking at you, Alex Jones. They jeer those who feel unable to keep going. I've seen too much of this, and it makes me want to bash heads. There are predators among us who delight in afflicting the afflicted. We live in an evil world where the weak are abused and are 
holier than thou churches and you need to do your best to stand in the gap if you can if you can you need to do your best to help those who suffer never give advice if you unless you really know what you're doing and basically those who know what they're doing almost never give advice and the only thing that you really can do is encourage someone who suffers to seek help and inspire them to strive for a purpose in life and the only real purpose that anyone can have is Christ in other words be a good friend I've had some of those who were there at the right time when I needed them the most now you might be wondering about why I'm talking about this after all the link of, that I just talked about is there at this specific moment and at, um, I'm talking about this article with that strange term smiling depression I think that a better term would be laughing depression but the writer didn't ask me and this term smiling depression is fine if people want to use it anyway this is the first time that I recall ever hearing that term and the author's use of the term is a pretty good description of myself and about half or more of those who are depressed in fact it has been my experience that the funniest guy in the room is usually the one who is the most depressed think of all the great comedians pretty much every single one of them is horribly depressed those who aren't are probably lying about it and I thought that everyone knew this from this article it seems that people do not know this in fact there's a more official term a typical depression oh right as if depression wasn't already atypical enough when I left the US to go back to Israel in 2010 I had a chance to help someone understand her father's suicide she was giving me a last haircut before me and my wife left and she was still puzzled and grieving over her father's recent self-inflicted death he had seemed so happy and, and ready to laugh and joke and he always lifted the spirits of everyone around him he was such a good dad and then one day he killed himself while everyone else was out shopping so I told her what was really going on in his tortured soul I told her much of what I just told you and by the time that the haircut was done she understood at least as much as she could she realized that death was the end of suffering for him unfortunately I, I don't think that he was a Christian when he died so I'm afraid that his suffering was just beginning oh and no I do not think that God will send you to hell for suicide but you will face God after you do that and he will be very unhappy with you for killing yourself think of it this way we have a job to do and you are not allowed to stop your work and go home early only when the job is done do you get to go home period so if you ever hear that I was hit by a bus or taken down by the ravenous bug bladder beast of trawl you'll know that my job was done and that I'm glad that it's over so please do your best to be a good friend to those who suffer and if you suffer well help yourself out by being a good friend you really can be a big help to yourself when you help others hey even baking cookies for someone can be a big help I know that one of you did that oh and being grateful to God that is a huge huge help I know that one I know that one personally I truly am grateful for all that God has done for me that gratitude has been a balm to my soul even though God has had to put up with a lot of complaining from me thankfully God is very patient with all of our moaning and groaning okay time for a humor break that was a bit depressing so the next link is titled the TLDR too long didn't read edition of all 66 books of the Bible from the Babylon Bee Karen J sent this in and it's a hoot although I didn't laugh hard enough to get Mrs. Little's, Little's attention until I got to the one about Job and then she made me read it all over again for her aloud here let me quote just a few of my favorites for you now quoting forget about reading through the Bible in a year now you can read through the Bible in about five minutes Genesis God makes everything and it's really good for about 3.2 seconds Leviticus stop doing gross stuff 
Deuteronomy, I said, stop doing gross stuff. Gosh, what is wrong with you people? First Kings, Solomon marries a ton of women and that turns out to be a really bad idea. Who knew? Esther, a brave Jewish woman saves her people, full of more exciting drama and an intrigue than any episode of Game of Thrones, plus way more clothing. Job, Hebrew country music song. This is where Mrs. Little made me start over. Ecclesiastes, everything is meaningless, except everything isn't really meaningless because God gives everything meaning. Whoa. Song of Solomon, kids, go ask your parents. Ezekiel, a total Lovecraftian mind trip with bones and eagles and flaming psychedelic wheels and stuff. Daniel, Daniel fights his own personal lions who also happen to be actual lions that want to eat him. Jonah, an anthropomorphic asparagus goes on an adventure with some pirates. And if you don't know that one, look it up. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Peter does dumb stuff, and he does it four times. Jesus is Messiah, the suffering servant, and God. And, of course, Peter does dumb stuff. Acts. Miracles, shipwrecks, lots of tongues. Basically, John MacArthur's worst nightmare. 1 Corinthians. Stop screwing stuff up, Corinth. 2 Corinthians. Corinth. I mean it this time, Corinth. Philippians. You can win sports games through Jesus. 1 Timothy. Ladies. Please stop talking. James, act more gooder, people. Second Peter, bro, Paul's really confusing. Please help. Jude, stop being heretics, please. K, thanks. Bye. Okay, poor Peter. His big mouth has been immortalized for 2,000 years. It's humor, but like all good humor, there's truth in it. Thanks, Karen. Okay, enough, thumb, enough fun and games. Let's talk treason most foul. Treason in Congress. Luke Rosiak had, was the one to alert us to this, but we have ignored him, so he wrote a book. And then, because of that book, someone interviewed him, and the first link in that interview is Disappearing Democrat, Democratic Scandal, Part 1, from Liberty Nation. I've been talking about Imran Awan and his infiltration of the Democrats in the House of Congress since early 2017. And this is literally the most insane thing that I've ever seen in Congress, and I've seen a lot of insane things. For those of you who do not remember, Imran Awan is a well-connected Pakistani who has been working for Debbie Wasserman Schultz as her IT guy. And she also let him work for a bunch of other Democrats in the House of Representatives. And he had complete and unrestricted access to all of their files, and it appears that he was copying their files for his own use, or for someone else's use. It sounds to me like he's selling those secrets to the Pakistan government, or he's selling those secrets to some government. That has been my take on this for a while, although I'm hardly an expert on these matters, but who else would buy this guy's information? Whatever the case, W. Wasserman Schultz has betrayed her country to some very, very evil people. She should be ashamed of herself, for at the very least, but Debbie doesn't understand shame. She's one of the most corrupt politicians in Washington and needs to spend the rest of her life in an orange jumpsuit. And then in part two, we hear that Luke Rosiak makes this incredible statement. Quote, I'm shocked by how corrupt Congress is. I've been an investigative reporter here in Washington for a decade, and I've seen a lot. But the cynicism in Capitol Hill, on Capitol Hill, and the willingness to put personal reputation above all else, this may not sound... Maybe everyone's saying, yes, we already know that. But this particular case, it kind of underscored. I saw things with my own eyes that were shocking." Close quote. To my fellow Americans, you need to realize that your country is gone. Finished. Kaput. It cannot be fixed. The corruption is too great, and we were the ones who helped make it happen. You should read Luke's book, Luke Rosiak, R-O-S-I-A-K, and you should prepare for the fall of what is left of America. The name of his book is Obstruction of Justice, How the Deep State Risk National Security to Protect the Democrats, again by Luke Rosiak. Here's the description of the book on Amazon. 
Quote, investigative reporter Luke Rosiak is being hailed as, quote, one of the smartest, most intelligent reporters in Washington, close quote, Tucker Carlson, and, quote, a bulldog by Dana Loesch for uncovering what is, or, quote, what is possibly the largest scandal and cover-up in the history of the United States of representatives, close quote, by Newt Gingrich. Gingrich, sorry. It's like something out of a spy novel. In the heat of the 2016 election, by the way, I continue to read the uh, description from Amazon, an unvetted Pakistani national with a proclivity for blackmail gained access to the computer files of one in five, that's 20%, in the House of De uh, Democrats, uh, sorry, one in five Democrats in the House of Representatives. He and his family lifted data off the House network, stole the identity of an intelligence specialist, and sent congressional electronic equipment to foreign officials. And that was only the beginning. Rather than protect national security, Congress and the Justice Department, the DOJ, schemed to cover up a politically inconvenient hack and an underlying fraud on Capitol Hill involving dozens of Democrats' offices. Evidence disappeared. Witnesses were threatened, and the supposed watchdogs in the media turned a blind eye. Combining tenacious investigative reporting and high-tech investigative techniques, Luke Rosiak began ferreting out the truth and found himself face-to-face -face with the deep state. Observing how Nancy Pelosi's Democrats manipulated the Department of Justice, the media, and even Republican leadership to sabotage the investigation into what Newt Gingrich calls possibly the biggest congressional stand, a scandal in history. Close quote. And that's the, what I would consider to be the sanitized Amazon description. I call what he talks about treason, pure and simple. And I suspect that there's a lot more treason than just this. This is so amazing. So buy his book, again, the book is titled, scroll back up, the book is titled Obstruction of Justice, How the Deep State Risked National Security to Protect the Democrats by Luke Rosiak. And again, his last name is spelled R-O-S-I-A-K. And since we are on the topic of corruption and treason, let's look at a couple more links on the subject. The first one is, do you believe in the deep state now? From the American conservative. You don't have to like Donald Trump to see that there is a horrendous problem in Washington, DC. The idea that federal bureaucrats could act outside the US Constitution and illegally initiate a coup is a shocking idea. In fact, before Barack Obama came to office, I would not have believed it myself. In fact, I never thought about it. Yes, I knew that the U.S. Department of State was full of Arabists and other kinds of dirtbags. I knew that the U.S. government was a giant mess. And I knew that there was something seriously wrong with the CIA, but all my focus was on the Middle East. Then Obama came to office. I was distracted a lot by a lot of things, and one of those was Mrs. Little. And I didn't see his corruption until his second term. And I knew that his Obamacare thing was utter insanity, but like I said, I was distracted. Then the scandal started to mount too high to ignore. And when I got my wake up call in 2011, I got an earful. Wow. And the deep state that he helped build on top of the one that his predecessors built, amazing. But even that was merely a shadow of what would be revealed in the election of Donald John Trump. I can hardly believe what I'm reading about these people. This is the death of America, and I'm afraid that it's richly deserved. And with that corruption, many have asked, where are the whistleblowers? Well, Kevin Shipp answers that question with his own experience as a CIA whistleblower in a YouTube video titled, titled where are the whistleblowers? This is yet another reason why the United States must be destroyed. Because of the CIA? Unfortunately, yes. I know that this is an extreme position to take, but the CIA is so malignant and unstoppable 
because they have their own source of funding, that the only way to stop them is to break America up and destroy those parts that are evil. Please understand that the CIA isn't just a menace to America. They are a menace to the rest of the world. There is no place safe from these vile and evil people. To put heroin on this, they put heroin on the streets of countries around the world. They engage in sex trafficking and the buying and selling of children. They undermine and overthrow governments without the approval of the U.S. President or Congress. They are a cancer that must be eliminated. Unfortunately, there are too few men like Kevin Shipp, so this cancer will not be eliminated. This means that God will do this. Remember the warnings that Jeremiah gave to Israel. If you repent and obey, you will be spared. If you will not, you will be utterly destroyed. Do you see the repentance and obedience in America? Well, there's your answer. Prepare for judgment. All of that treason will prepare, for the, prepare the way for the Antichrist. The problem is that there are a few problems that he needs to deal with to make that rise happen. And this next link talks about seven of them. It's infographic, the seven major flaws of the global financial system. For those of you who are watching for the rise of the beast, the system ruled by the Antichrist, these seven flaws in the system need to be addressed for that system to rise and take over. And the very first of them is the fact that almost a quarter of the world does not have a bank account. Think that through for a moment. And you'll realize that from the get-go, there is an extremely serious challenge here. How will the Antichrist solve these seven problems? Well, we'll get a chance to see, but it will take Ezekiel's fire to get it started. And I shudder at the thought of going through that. This next group of links are horrifying. They're about child rapists on YouTube. And I might need to apologize in advance for some of the awful stuff that I'm about to say. But this is important, and it needs to be said, as much as I do not want to. And there are two main links that I want to talk about first. The first is, on YouTube, a network of pedophiles is hiding in plain sight from Wired UK. The fact that these pedophiles aren't hunted down is sickening, and yes, these people need to be locked up or killed. Having said that, we are not allowed to kill them. That's God's job or the job of the state. It's the job of the law. And I probably wouldn't want these people killed if they were just at least imprisoned for their evil. Unfortunately, it is my understanding that those who delight in the rape of children cannot be cured of their evil nature. Once a child rapist, always a child rapist. Of course, God can change them if they have truly accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but with all the evil pastors who are raping kids, do you really want to trust someone like this? The bottom line? This is just another sign of how evil our society is and how much it needs to be destroyed. If there is a God, and yes, there is one, and if he is just, and yes, he is, then we must be destroyed. There is a God, and his wrath will descend upon us, and soon. Then I saw a link on Zero Hedge titled, Disney, Nestle, Pull YouTube Ads Over Soft Core Pedo Ring Exposed by Blogger. And I clicked a link to a video inside that article, and that video was titled, YouTube is facilitating the sexual exploitation of children and it's being monetized, 2019, YouTube. Do not watch that video, do not click that link. If you do not want to get so angry, you'll want to break things and break people. Me? <laughs> I want God to kill them all, every single one of them. These filthy child rapists need to die. And I don't care if some of them haven't touched a child yet, which I, I highly doubt. I believe these people already have done their dirty deeds. I want God to kill them, dead. And I would love permission from God to help him in this, and it's not as if he needed that help. How does God feel about this? 
He wants them dead more than I do. And the only reason why he hasn't destroyed them is that there are souls that still need to be rescued before he removes the block that keeps Satan from bringing the Antichrist. Yes, that's right. And that block is going to be removed. And this entire world will be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, in the same way that Paul speaks of in 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. And we will be there also. When that happens, billions will die. And we will des deserve it because we let this happen. We did this. We allowed it. So we will suffer. And make no mistake, we could track these perverts down. We know how to do this. For crying out loud, I know how to do this. But we won't, because we are evil. Seriously, it's not hard to track data packets if you are in control of the networks. But the NSA, the CIA, the GCHQ, and the FBI, all and all others, don't want these perverts taken down. YouTube and Google don't. Wall Street and Washington, D.C. don't. Children are precious in the sight of God, and we are destroying them. Then, to add insult to injury, we have the Roman Catholic Church doing worse than that. In fact, I've chosen to adjust their name a bit. I call them the foul and evil Roman Catholic Church of Satan, or Furkos for short. The evil coming from the Roman Catholic Church and other child rapists is horrifying. How dare they do this? I pray that they repent and seek to undo what they have done, but if they will not, I pray that God would remove them. What an utterly horrifying thing for these foul and evil men and women to do, to harm little children. To paraphrase the words of Jesus, it would be better if you had died than to harm one of these little ones. And I have six links talking about what the foul and evil Roman Catholic Church of Satan is doing. The first one is titled, The Vatican's Secret Rules for Priests Who Have Children. Wow, this is so vile and revolting I can hardly believe it. It shows just how corrupt the Roman Catholic Church is. So, not only do we have 80% of Vatican priests that, that are homosexual, we have horrifying pedophiles that are raping little boys and girls. Then we have implicit acceptance of infidelity, fornication, and rape among the priests. They took vows of celibacy, not vowels of celibacy. They took vows of celibacy and they violated those vows. But nothing happened to them. They were protected even. This is so horrendous, I'm going to quote three sections of this piece. Quote, the long-standing tradition of celibacy among the Roman Catholic clergy was broadly codified in the 12th century, but not necessarily adhered to, even in the highest places. Rodrigo Borgia, while a priest, had four children with his mistress before he became Pope Alexander VI, an excess that helped spur Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation. Luther wrote mockingly that, the Pope had as much command over celibacy as the natural movement of the bowels. There are no estimates of how many such children exist, but Mr. Doyle said that the website for his support group, Coping International, has 50,000 users in 175 countries. Wait. This stupid, unbiblical vow of celibacy was invented about 900 years ago? What moron came up with this idiocy? I know, I know. I could look it up, but I'm too disgusted to do that now. So let's get to some more disgust going, gets more disgust going by quoting another part of this article. Quote, Some children of priests, however, wish their fathers were forced out of the ministry. Reverend Pietro Tosi was 54 when he raped Eric Zatoni's mother, who was 14. Mr. Zatoni said, her family tried to force the priest to recognize their son, but he refused. The family was evicted from their parish-owned home in a tiny town outside of Ferrara, Italy, where they often bumped into each other. He never said anything, said Mr. Zatoni, now 37. In 2010, Mr. Zatoni sued Father Tosi, demanding to be recognized. 
a court-ordered DNA test demonstrated that he was, in fact, the priest's son. The Vatican eventually instructed Father Tosi's bishop to admonish him and remind him of his responsibilities as a father, but did not demand his removal from the priesthood. How convenient. After a national news program highlighted his case, hundreds of Italians filled a Ferrara Piazza in 2013 to show support for Mr. Zatoni and press Francis to take up his case. Father Tosi died in 2014, still a priest. So, this disgusting priest, this father, was still accepted as a priest by the Roman Catholic Church, even though there was absolute proof that he raped a 14-year-old girl. What a vile, evil, nauseating church. How is it that these morons can call themselves holy? Are they too stupid to understand their hypocrisy? Are they so corrupted that they no longer understand the word holy? Or is it both? I actually believe that they really are utter morons who are too corrupt to either see that they are drooling idiots or that they are destined for eternal fire. And yes, the Pope also. The whole foul bunch are going straight to hell forever. But let's dip a third time into this article, if you can stand it. Quote, the children of priests are increasingly turning to DNA tests to prove that their parents are either priests or nuns. It's a breakthrough and anyone can do it, said Linda Lawless, 56, an amateur genealogist in Australia and herself the daughter of a priest who has helped members of Coping International. Her mother kept her paternity secret, but Ms. Law Law Ms. Lawless remembered noticing as a child that her mother was absolutely terrified whenever priests visited the house. Close quote. Her mother was terrified? So these foul priests aren't just raping their congregation, they're also terrorizing them into submission. These are soulless ghouls feasting on the dead bodies of their congregation. These twisted psychopaths are fiends from hell that are doing their best to take as many people as they can into eternal torment. I would ask that God would destroy these foul and evil abominations, but God is already doing that. I think that a part of my outrage is in how stupid this all is. If you're going to pull a fast one on us, if you're going to trick us, at least you could, the least that you could do is be intelligent about it. This is an insult. This is like being swindled by a halfwit. We're outraged and I'm outraged and disgusted. And then we have a second link titled French judge refuses to block Catholic sex scandal movie from hosted. And this quote, wow, quote, pray not. And by the way, this guy's a priest. Pray not is a priest. Pray not has confessed to abusing Boy, Boy Scouts and his victims say church hierarchy can covered up for him for years, allowing him to work with children right up until his 2015 retirement, close quote. And the Roman Catholic Church wanted to suppress this movie, citing a presumption of innocence. Sorry, but that's a legal term. The truth is a different matter, and I'm glad that this movie exposes just how foul and vile the foul and evil Roman Catholic Church of Satan is. The good thing is that this foul and evil priest had enough decency to write letters to the families, confessing the abuse that he had committed. My hope is that this represents true repentance, the real kind, but you'll notice that he's declaring himself innocent or at least not declaring himself guilty. The foul church that is protecting him certainly isn't declaring him guilty either. The Roman Catholic Church needs to be officially renamed, and at the very least it should be called the Roman Catholic Church of Satan. But I like to add foul and evil at the beginning of that. It's a small change, but an accurate one. The Catholic Church of Satan. It has a certain ring to it. The ring of truth, but I'll continue to call it the foul and evil Roman Catholic Church of Satan. 
And if the priests weren't bad enough, we have nuns. That's right, nuns. Titled, Inside the Horrifying Unspoken World of Sexually Abusive Nuns. Nuns have been sexually abused, meaning raped. And now we're finding that nuns, or nuns like them, are raping little girls. The Roman Catholic Church. Nuns. Raping little girls. What a sick and twisted entity. And then Lionel of Lionel Media, the comedian and who's also a lawyer, has a video that engages in a bit of wonderful, wishful, wistful thinking. It's titled, In the Name of the Victims, We Must Seize Vatican Assets Via Rico-esque Litigation and Prosecutions on YouTube. This is what needs to be done, but it won't be. We need to take the assets of the Vatican, all of them. We need to do it now. Oh, but hey, there's so much more, so very much more. We have deaf children being raped by priests. Titled, The Pope Ignored Them. Alleged abuse of deaf children on two continents points to Vatican failings from NOLA.com. This is horrifying. I couldn't finish it. I could barely start it. I want every building owned by the Roman Catholic Church of Satan bulldozed flat. Every item that they own should remain inside them as we bulldoze these buildings. I want every asset that they have handed over to their victims. I want no sign that there ever existed anywhere a Roman Catholic Church of Satan on this planet. These people are Satanists, plain and simple. They are minions of the Prince of Darkness, and they have no conscience, honor, or integrity. They have no shame, and they are drenched in the blood of innocence. They blaspheme God by calling themselves Christian. And I ask that God would send his wrath upon them until they repent. They are truly the Roman Catholic Church of Satan. And then, to make us laugh, the Pope says the Church's attack attackers are linked to the devil. Oh, really? How ironic. We think that he's linked to the devil. I wonder which one of us is right. Okay, if you're as mad about all that as I am, you might need to take some time to scream and break things. I'll wait if you need to. Okay, are we ready to move on? You're sure? Okay. So let's talk about evidence that Ezekiel's fire is real and has already happened at least once in our solar system. Yep, you heard that right. And here's a link. Earth Catast Catastrophe Cycle, Observing the Frontier on YouTube. Okay, you'll need to wade through a bit of foolishness in the middle of this video and there's some scientific jargon that might be a bit hard to understand. But the main point is that there is evidence on the moon that super flares or a micronova has already happened. The kind of glass found on the moon cannot be created any other way. And we also have evidence of stars emitting micronovas on a regular, even yearly basis. This means that something like this might have happened before, say at the time of the great flood. And when it's time for Ezekiel's fire to happen, well, it'll happen again. This will shock the world in ways that we haven't seen since the Great Flood. The Bible talks about it, so you need to be ready for it. And then there's more evidence for peak oil. Seriously. The link is titled, ExxonMobil U.S. Oil and Gas Financial Trainwreck. Producing Shale is Destroying Its Bottom Line. SRS Rocco Report. I just can't believe that ExxonMobil is doing this. Looking at the figures, their, share, their shale operations are destroying them. What insanity is this? Just looking at the graphs is enough to make you choke on your coffee. Don't be eating or drinking anything while you read that article. There are two takeaways from this article. First, peak oil is just as real as I have been saying. And of course, I'm not the only one. Second, sell your stock in ExxonMobil. I can hardly believe 
how stupid this is. The next one is short, but serious. The persecutions of Christians in China he is happening. And it's titled, 150 Pastors Arrested at Year-End Gathering. And they're talking about the, year, uh, the end of the Chinese New Year. Mrs. Little showed this to me, and this is a very serious escalation. Please pray for our brothers and sisters in China. The days are getting darker and darker there, and their suffering is getting worse and worse. You and I, we, we have a good. We live like kings compared to them. And now they are beginning to suffer more and more and more persecution. We will know what they are going through one day. They already know that the pre-tribulation rapture theory is an evil lie. They're already going through that kind of persecution. And we'll find that out too when our turn comes. And the people who were spreading this lie will know that they kept us from preparing for the persecution that is coming. Again, pray for those who suffer. Our own time is coming. With all that is evil, with all that the evil, I'm sorry, this is a family channel. We're all friends here, so I'm not going to redo all that. We're just making mistakes. It's okay. With all the evil that is in this world, it helps to see prophecy being fulfilled right before our eyes. And the prophecy that I'm talking about is found in Isaiah 19. And Isaiah 19 is about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. It has been a while since I published anything on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, or GERD. This is partly due to a dramatic slowdown in construction, all because of corruption. However, a new government has taken over and new contractors have been brought in. And the delays in building this dam are only going to make the filling of it even more extreme. This dam must go online as soon as possible to start repaying all the debts that they have accumulated. And the new government in Addis Ababa will want to demonstrate results to stay in power. This means that all those promises that they made to Egypt, where they promised and vowed that they will carefully fill, slowly fill the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, all those promises will be completely and utterly broken. I believe that they will fill that dam as fast as possible, drying up the Nile just as chapter 19 of Isaiah said that they would. For four years, the Ethiopians have been saying that they will start filling this dam in the next year, and then they never do. This time, I believe that they mean what they say. This is going to be traumatic for Egypt, just as Isaiah said it would be. And we have five links in this section, and here's the first one. Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam to launch its energy production from Construction and Engineering Digest magazine. Here are the first three sentences of this article. Quote, Ethiopia is set to start producing energy at the Grand Renaissance Dam next year. This is according to Seleshi Bekele, Water and Sanitation Minister. We expect the dam to be fully operational by the end of 2022. 750 megawatts of power is planned initial production with two turbines by December next year, said the minister. December next year? We're talking the end of 2019. That's next year, guys. Hopefully, for the sake of Egypt, he's lying, because if he's not, the Nile will be dry in two years or maybe just a year, who knows? They are saying that the dam is 80% complete, but they have not begun to fill the reservoir that will complete the project. And if they fill that dam too fast, Egypt will die. And it looks like they will fill that dam way too fast. Here's the second link. Ethiopia contracts Chinese con uh, companies to complete Nile Dam construction from African News. Here are those new contractors that Ethiopia has brought in to finish the dam. The Chinese. And when you deal with the Chinese, be ready to pay soon and on time. If you don't, you lose. Big. 
Bringing in the Chinese will mean that Ethiopia will be under even greater pressure to fill that dam and make it fully operational. And the Chinese do not care how many Egyptians will die in the process. Are you starting to see a catastrophe here? And then here's link three. CGGC inks U.S. $40.1 million accord with Ethiopia's Hydro Dam Project from China.org.cn. Here's a report of even more Chinese contractors, and they need these Chinese companies because the Ethiopian companies have been cheating the government and can no longer be trusted. So here come the Chinese. Oh, and where did the money come from to hire these Chinese firms? Want to bet that it's from the Chinese government? Yeah, I, I wouldn't take that bet either. My suspicion is that Commandante Xi is behind all this. And he knows how to use thumb screws. For link four, the title is just enough. Chinese firms brought in to pick up pace on Ethiopian Nile Dam. And then the last of these five, five links about the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam at a standstill. Politics from Egypt. Ahram Online. And to show why Ethiopia changed contractors, this is the headline from a month ago. And you can see that Egypt was happy at the delay. It should not be. This delay will only increase the desperation of the Ethiopian government to show results. If anything, Egypt should have helped get that dam completed as soon as possible to start the filling process and keep that process slow. But they played silly games, as Egyptians seem want to do. The Egyptian government has always been corrupt and stupid. As much as I would love to tell some of the stories about their complete idiocy, we don't have time for that. So we'll just move on. But just remember, kids, Isaiah 19 is coming. And it's going to be bad. This next one will hit a little more close to home. It's about economic and financial collapse. We've been talking about the collapse of the economy and financial system for a very long time. And every day that collapse is, de is delayed, well, just, just think about this. The eventual collapse, because of these delays, just becomes worse and worse. Eventually, it will be an explosion that will devastate the world and lead to chaos, confusion, death, destruction, and war. Lots and lots of war. In fact, it has begun already. By the time that you see it, it will be too late to do anything about it. And I'll spare you all the details and hit you with pretty much the headlines. European car sales fall for fifth month in a row. Another ouch, not good kids, not good at all. Another one, China accounts for more than 60% of all new credit created globally in the past 10 years. What China is doing is insane. But the Chinese Communist Party is desperate to stay alive. Unfortunately, I just don't see how they can stay alive with the amount of debt that they've been accumulating. Here's the next one. A world full of zombies, global revenue growth has collapsed. Read that if you want. The headline says it all. Growth is falling. And if you consider that a lot of the growth that they claim is actually not growth is a lie, well, I think that things are bad and getting worse. And then Rabobank, China's borrowing was insane. In January, it borrowed 5% of GDP in one month. Wait, China borrowed 5% of its gross domestic product in one month? That, that is shocking. Please watch China closely. This is bad. And then, China car sales plunge most in seven years amid global auto industry meltdown. So there are car sales falling in China. And then this one, world's largest shipping company warns 2019 global economic outlook is worse than 2018. Oh yeah, it's going to be a lot worse than 2018. They're trying to blame trade tensions for this one, but don't believe it. Container shipping is down for the same reason that the Baltic Dry Index is down. 
This will not end well, end well, kids. Please be careful out there. Financial collapse is coming to your hometown. Now, when fin economic and financial collapse comes your way, you need something tangible to weather the storm. Right now, I cannot think of anything tangible that is so fiercely undervalued and universally recognized as gold, silver, and, well, gold and silver. There might be other things that are better, I just can't see them. If you can think of something better, share it with us. And while I am a bit cynical about cryptocurrencies, that doesn't mean that they aren't an alternative worth, something worth looking into. And we have a couple of excellent links to talk about. The first link is a short one from Macro Tourist. Guess who's buying gold? Or actually, it's titled Guess Who's Buying? And of course, it's about gold. Central banks are buying gold. And that's very interesting. And of course, the next link is about the reason why they're buying gold. And it's a doozy. Titled Bear Market in Gold and Silver is Over by Craig. Uh, an interview with Craig Hemke, and it's from Greg Hunter's USAWatchdog.com. This is the write-up for the interview that Greg Hunter did with Craig, and the first part of that drops a bombshell, and you need to pay attention to this. Quote, financial writer and precious metals expert Craig Hemke says, the bear market in gold and silver is over. Hemke contends the central banker's price suppression of gold and silver is grinding to a close. Hemke explains, they created the illusion of physical delivery. What happens when the bank's wanting the gold because it's now a tier one asset? Say I can't play this promissory note, again, note game anymore. What happens when they say that? Just like physical demand broke the U.S. for suppression price in the 1950s, and just like physical demand broke the London gold pool price in the 1960s, physical demand will break this fractional reserve and derivative pricing scheme that has worked since 1975. It's now going to fail, too. Anybody that has one ounce of gold will be darn glad that they have it when the time comes. Hemke says... There are several factors leading to the perfect storm of price explosion for precious metals. On April 1st, new rules will allow banks to hold gold as a so-called Tier 1 asset. Hemke points out, this is why central banks are buying gold too. Gold will be considered a riskless asset just like treasury bonds. The way it is currently structured now, if you had $1 billion in gold in your reserves in the bank, you could only count half of that as your reserves. So $1 billion in gold would only be counted as $500 million. Now, with the new rules, it will count for the full $1 billion. Okay, so here's the key part of that bombshell. On April 1st, that's just a few weeks from now, New rules will allow banks to hold gold as a so-called Tier 1 asset that they can claim on a one-to-one -one basis. This might be the gold moonshot that we've been looking for. I don't know if that's true, but this is a very, very big incentive to buy gold by at least central banks. Just remember that you need to have gold to be able to take advantage of the rise in gold. Having said that, I prefer silver and, well, just remember, I am no longer a financial expert and cannot give you financial advice. I'm only giving, telling you what I would do in your position. Okay, we're almost done and I'm glad that you are still with me. Kids, we need to talk about Gog or Magog. Our first link is an important one and it's titled... Turkey, uniting an army of Islam to defeat just one country. And you know what that one country is. That's right, Turkey is calling for a united Islamic army to invade and destroy Israel. Here are the first three paragraphs of the article. Quote, Istanbul recently hosted the Second International Islamic Union Congress, sponsored mainly by the Strategic Research Center for Defenders of Justice, or ASSAM. 
which it's, I guess it's Turkish, which is headed by Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's chief military advisor, Adnan Tanriverdi, a retired lieutenant general and an Islamist. At the conference, Tanriverdi Tan delivered a speech detailing the inner workings of the Islamic Confederal State that ASAM, A-S-S-A-M, aims to establish with 61 Muslim countries. In his address, Tanriverdi said that a rapid deployment force should be created. Judging by an article Tanriverdi penned in 2009, the purpose of this joint Islamic force is to defeat Israel, which should be made to get engaged in war, and the length of the war should be extended. If Israel, quoting him, if Israel has to call all of its reserve soldiers to duty, he explained, there will be no one left at home or in their businesses. It cannot continue like that for a long time, close quote. Of course, that's only the beginning, just the beginning. And the non-Arab Muslims will gather their forces together to invade and destroy Israel. Those of us who read the Bible know that this is the coming of Gog and Magog. And those of you who live outside of Israel will be in even greater peril because it will also be the coming of Ezekiel's fire, or Isaiah's son, depending on how you want to call that. But my book is called Ezekiel's Fire. You really need to be ready for Ezekiel's fire. You can start by reading my book on it. It's free. As I keep saying, it might save your life. I certainly hope it will. But that's Turkey. And Turkey is an important player in Gog and Magog, but the Bible also refers to a country that we all know as a complete mess right now. That, company, that country is Libya. When I first realized that Russia was backing Khalifa Haftar in eastern Libya, I realized that this helped me identify a big piece that I was missing in the Gog and Magog puzzle. All the other members of the Gog and Magog alliance had identified themselves and were moving into place, except for Libya and, well, Kush. Kush is a part of the Gog and Magog alliance, and I'm not sure whether Kush is Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, or another country in sub-Saharan Africa. We'll see how Kush falls into place. But we know where Libya is, and we know that Libya must be in the Gog and Magog alliance. And it looks like the one who will be bringing Libya into that Gog and Magog alliance is someone named Khalifa Haftar. And I have four links that talk about how well he is doing as he conquers the rest of Libya. The first link is this one. Libya remains a battleground eight years after Gaddafi revolt from Al Jazeera. The corrupt UN-backed government in Tripoli can't seem to get its act together and they don't really control any part of Libya other than the outskirts of their quote-unquote capital, Tripoli. These morons can't stop fighting each other long enough to stop Haftar from taking over all of Libya, and Haftar is very good friends with Russia. Very, very good friends. Up to now, Haftar only controlled the northeast of Libya. Not now. Now he controls the southwest, too, pretty soon. He'll have everything except Tripoli, and then Tripoli will essentially give up. They're too stupid to govern themselves, let alone hold out against Haftar. And then this next link happened. Libya's largest oil field seized by forces loyal to Khalifa Haftar, and it's from Nigerian News. Here's more on Haftar's latest achievements. Not only does he control the main oil terminals that are used to sell the oil that Libya produces, but now he pretty much controls the oil fields. And then we see the Russia connection in this third link. Russia TV, Haftar negotiating establishing Russian military base in Benghazi from the Libya Observer. And Russia's support of Haftar is bearing fruit. He's giving them a nice big base in Benghazi, right on the coast of the Mediterranean. Tell me again why it was such a good idea for Obama and Hillary to bomb Libya, arm the rebels, and murder Gaddafi. And Hillary gloated over murdering Gaddafi. Because, this, because of this murder, Libya will be able to join Russia and Turkey and Iran for the attack on Israel that Bi the Bible calls Gog and Magog. Oh, 
And the fourth link brings in another member of the Gog and Magog alliance. Again, we're talking about Libya. It's towards a larger role for Turkey in the Libyan peace process. Turkey is getting involved? Yeah, how nice. The next thing you know, Iran will be there working to make peace in Libya. And yes, things are just that ridiculous. So, to finish our news and analysis with one last link, it's about Israel. In fact, this might be a part of what launches Gog and Magog, or at least something like it. It's titled, Palestinians Say Israel Playing with Fire by Closing Temple Mount Gate. And it's from the Jerusalem Post. I'm sorry, I'm having hiccups. I keep saying that I feel sorry for the Palestinians, but it, and it's true. I pity stupid people. And the Palestinians are about as stupid a group of people as you can possibly find. Individually, they can be quite intelligent. But when you get enough of them together, their collective IQ falls to shoe size level. Israel has been trying to encourage them to a higher level of intelligence, but the Palestinians keep insisting that stupidity is the better way. The Palestinians, walking proof that you just can't fix stupid. And one day they will play a role in the coming of Gog and Magog by rising up and attacking Jerusalem and giving them an excuse to come down and, and attempt to destroy Israel. And of course, when God finally destroys this army of Gog and Magog, the Palestinians will have destroyed themselves in the process. I guess that total destruction is one way to fix stupid. Okay, that's it for this week's Shockcast. I really hope that you'll be ready for what is coming. A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Proverbs 22.3 Again, make sure that you are subscribed to the Shock, the shock Letter at theshockletter.com. For those of you on YouTube, hit that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications. And if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And I mean, click the thumbs up button. All of that helps you and me get the message out. And check out the boxes at the end of this video. Those links will take you to other Shockcasts, a link to subscribe to the Shockcast, as well as a link to the important playlist or the playlist of important videos of this past week. And don't forget my book, Ezekiel's Fire, at EzekielsFire.com. You need to read that book, and it's free for now. And so allow me to close with this blessing from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. Yevarechecha Yehovah Vishmerecha. Yeer Yehovah Panavelecha Vichunecha. Yisa Yehovah, panavalecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Number 6, 24 to 26. I pray that your pastor will give you the words that you need to hear to help you walk the path that God has called for you to follow. And Lord willing, we will see each other next week.